Praise God. It's a joy to be with you. I did it just like him, but only he had the technology. <laughs> I'm old school. I've got paper in my hand. <laughs> but that's okay. It's still the word of God. Amen. 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 Uh, just so blessed. And uh, as he was talking about our family, I just want to share something special that happened to me a few weeks ago. You know, we pray for our sons and our children, our grandchildren. We pray and pray and pray. And we're very thankful that our three sons are serving the Lord. They love the Lord. And one is a pastor. And he had, to, um, he had a ministry engagement in Ireland. And his assistant pastor was away. And the other young man that he's training to preach and teach, uh, he just didn't feel that it was his time yet. So he calls his dad. And we were involved in a conference when he called. He said, Dad, I need you. <laughs> so needless to say, we said yes. And as soon as the conference ended, we got in our car and we were heading to New York City to um, preach this Sunday morning. But my experience was, and I didn't see this until uh, a week later, as his church, they post all these pictures. And I'm looking at the pictures from that sermon that my husband preached, but during the worship time, I'm standing there worshiping the Lord, and behind me is my 22-year-old grandson with hands lifted up, worshiping the Lord. I'd never seen that or experienced that. It was like, oh God, you're doing it. Legacy, legacy, hallelujah. God is touching my grandkids. And so we spend many hours praying for those nine grandchildren. And then they begin to see the fruit of that. I am so grateful to be here. He has talked and talked about the Philippine church, the body of Christ here. So has Pastor Mark Kaiser, and so has Kathy and Coy Doe, who came with him when he was here the last time. And they do send all of you greetings. Amen. Um, I know the theme is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But I also know the Holy Spirit. And when our pastor was prophesying, he was like the Lord saying to me, okay, you've got this. Because my title is not that. My title is the anointing. Amen. Amen. So let's just listen to whatever God may have for us this, this afternoon. Um, the anointing. I think I have a slide. Yes. <laughs> um, Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. We all understand what the presence of God, we've experienced it, haven't we? Being here today in our worship time. We understand what the presence of God is. We understand the anointing. And, and, and at, at some point of our lives, we have truly benefited from just being in God's presence. There are books that have been written about it. As I Googled and I found all these kinds of books, there is the Deborah anointing. And I looked at women. There is the Hannah anointing. These are actually books that you can find online and read them. There have been several books written just about the anointing. But our definition for anointing for this afternoon is to be anointed is to be covered in consecrated oil, which is spiritual and not of the flesh. To dedicate to the service of God requires us to live a life of consecration, prayer, and fasting so we can maintain that presence of God in our lives. Because I, want to just, I don't want to just experience here in worship and I don't walk it out throughout the day. I don't walk it out when I'm working with students. I want to have his presence at all, all time. There is an anointing that we have experienced in this room. Once I took a Bible class and I found out that Sister Sylvia has been here and I took her class on the anointing. And if you remember her class, it was about three things about the anointing. The anointing that dwells within you. We find in Romans 8 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And you also find in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. You have that anointing. You have that anointing not 
just when we're corporately worshiping. You have that anointing when we're in a store and a mother is screaming at her child. There is an anointing for that, amen? <laughs> There's the anointing that comes upon you. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It takes an anointing sometimes for me to travel. He's been traveling all his life. He is a military kid and he has lived in Japan, North Dakota, Germany, you name it. And then of course he's traveled a lot when he was missions director of Elam Fellowship. I did not travel until I married him. I stayed at home. But since I've been married to him, I've done nothing but travel. And it does take an anointing. It took us 20 some hours to get here. You need an anointing for that, you know, to do that kind of traveling. Also in Luke 24, verse 49, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The anointing that comes upon you by the Holy Spirit. The first one was the anointing that dwells within us. And then there's an anointing that comes upon you. And the third one is the anointing that rests upon you. John 1, 32, 33. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. It's also found in Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The anointing can come, and maybe you felt that as we were worshiping. You just felt the Holy Spirit resting upon you, and you could just, you know, I, I, I sit and stand and worship, but I'm hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit at the same time. I'm singing the song, but I'm asking the Lord to rest upon me, to speak to me. Numbers 11, 17 and 24 through 25 says, I will come down and talk to you there. I will take some of the spirit that is upon you and I will put the spirit upon them also. They will bear the burden of the people along with you so you will not have to carry it alone. So Moses went out and reported the Lord's words to the people. He gathered the 70 elders and stationed them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But this never happened again with them. But it happens with us. When we sense the spirit of God, it's for all of us, not just Sister Lindy, Linda and Brother Norman. That Holy Spirit can rest upon you before you know it. You hear the word of the Lord. You sense the word of the Lord. The anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you hear his words and you can't but help but prophesy. You can't help but prophesy. But I, you know, these are things that were taught to me in Bible class and they're wonderful. But I want to transition into three other anointings that God has spoken to me about. And they are the kingly anointing, the priestly anointing, and the prophetic anointing. Those are the three I want to just uh, target for this afternoon. The kingly anointing. A king represents authority and power. When he speaks, things happen. People obey. I've never been in the presence of a king. Oh, we lived in Nigeria for two years, and they had kings in, um, in, that, in that way. But because I was not a Nigerian, I didn't feel the response necessary to obey. But if you've ever lived with a king or you've read stories about kings, you know that people obeyed. You stood straight, you listened, you obey. When he speaks, things happen. The kingly anointing gives us authority. We have authority over sin and temptations. We have the power to do what Jesus did while he was here on earth. 
That's a kingly anointing. We, he has given us authority. And sometimes we don't realize that. And we just decide that we're not going to, you know, we, we weaken. And we, we step backwards when things happen. But no, I have a kingly anointing. And I can say to the sin that wants to pop up in my mind or in my life, no. Not in this house. Not in this body. There's a quote that I'd like to read with to you. Dr. John Paulus, author of the book, Release the River Within You, Increasing the Anointing Flow, stated, Jesus promised in no uncertain terms that we could come to the place spiritually that we could do the same works he did. That's authority. We can do the same works he did. Do you wake up in the morning with that sense of authority in your life where you know you can do what Jesus did? We can do the same works that he did. He did mighty works because he was the king of kings. And we can do mighty works because we have been made kings unto God. What a powerful quote. What a mindset to wake up and realize who you are. What anointing can rest upon you that you can have that type of authority. Revelations 1.6 says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Verily I say to you in John 14, 12 through 14, verily, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The kingly authority glorifies God because the works that he did, we can do on this earth. We just gotta believe for it. We've just gotta have the mindset. We have to put, uh, put on the mind of Christ that says whatever he did, I can do also because he's given us that authority. In Matthew, some other verses that I didn't write them all out on the slide, but I'm going to go through them. <clears throat> Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. The Bible says Jesus went about healing all diseases. Sometimes when I'm praying for someone who's sick, I have to pull that word back into my spirit and ask God, give me the anointing to heal and to touch and to bring wholeness to people. And I just believe for it. He's given us that kingly authority. We don't activate it sometimes. We, do, we doubt, we don't think that it's possible, but we have to start believing that as the people of God. We have that authority. We have to speak it and believe it. Amen. In Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm telling you that we keep bringing that example up, but that lady was bound. We had to loose her. And it took authority, not running out of the store, but authority. And we have a greater authority than her profanity that she was espousing. And by the end of my conversation with her, her words had changed. We have to take authority over the enemy. Matthew 18, 18. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Another verse on the same topic. Luke 4, 32. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Would that our teaching have authority? Would that when we stand before people that we speak with authority? We have to ask for it. We have to activate it. We need a confirmation like I got, that you have anointing, girl. Go for it. Amen. We have that anointing. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. People with authority have just enough faith to declare things, just enough simple faith to believe what 1 John 5, 4, 4 says. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Kingly authority requires faith, faith. Colossians 1, 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches 
of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us. We have that anointing, that kingly anointing. We need to learn how to walk in it. Christ is in you, and you have the authority to declare the word of God. Now, not your words. We're not going to be declaring our own words. We declare the word of God over your life, and by faith, we believe it. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We walk in authority, and we walk in power. Acts 27, 25. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. The song says, you, that we sing in America, I don't know if you sing it here, but there's a song, I think it's uh, Cece uh, Winings, yeah. She sings this song and says, you said it, I believe it. You said it, it is done. When God says it, and you have heard the Spirit of the Lord because he's rested upon you, you can believe it, it is done. It's time for us to start walking and kingly anointing. The second uh, one is entitled the priestly anointing. It's a, you know, my husband talked about it also earlier about, he actually declared that over you, you as a body. He, did, he spoke about the priestly anointing he sensed in his spirit when you were in worship. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm supposed to do this teaching. <laughs> You're telling me that. So, I mean, I got a notebook of teaching just in case I felt the Lord said, go this way. You, uh, but again, it was a confirmation. It's a call to prayer. It's a call to sacrifice. The priestly anointing is a call to fasting. It's a call to act as priests in your home. Not necessarily in the church. God's calling us to be a priest in our home in our workplace, wherever we go in the journey that he has in your life, you're called to walk with the anointing of a priest. But you are, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. A priest is one who intercedes before God for another person, a family, a city, or a nation. And I hope that you are interceding and you are activating that anointing in your life for your family. I felt that was my answer to all the interceding, all of that priestly anointing that my husband and I have joined together over our grandchildren. He's the oldest one, he's 22. And I've got one little one that's gonna turn nine next week. And, I, and he is so active. And I said, God, he needs something. He needs you. He needs your anointing. You know, and I can't wait to see him take all that energy for the service of the Lord Jesus. It's going to be an exciting time because we are interceding for him. We're interceding for our family. We intercede for our nation because we know our nation needs prayer. I was, uh, you know, and sometimes in the natural you see things and you think, well, all this, this, this anointing isn't really working because I read the news this morning and something happened in the U.S. and I was so disappointed by what was happening there. But I, it, it forced me to believe and to keep after it and to keep after it. Even though in the natural it doesn't seem like it's working. I know that God is doing something in the spiritual realm over our nation. So we must continue to intercede. Prayer and intercession are communicating with God, and we are called to be a people of prayer. The Bible says, pray without what? Ceasing. The disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray, not to sing and worship. They, they asked, teach us to pray. Maybe they had the worship and the singing already down, because we really need that too. But they said what we were lacking is the ability to know how to pray. And so they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. They knew from the life of Jesus there was something about prayer because they had watched the man of God pray. They would watched the Son of God pray. And they wanted what he had. They wanted that same priestly anointing. You have been anointed for a life of prayer and fasting. Oswald Chambers says, prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work powerful quote prayer is the greater work 
We want to see all the miracles and all the signs and wonders. Get on our knees. Pray. Consecrate yourself. Spend some time fasting. In Luke 2.37, the Bible says, And there was a widow, Anna, and she was 84 years old. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Age has nothing to do with anointing. The anointing for prayer can rest upon you at any age. 84 years old. By the way, and some of you may not have known uh, Sister Sylvia uh, Evans, she's 83 today. She is still going around the world. She is still preaching and teaching because she has the anointing. And the anointing will take you places where you think you could not go. There is an anointing that is for all of us. 1 John 5.14 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What is anything? What is anything? You need to ask yourself that and be confident that he hears you. Is there anything, we say it all the time, but do we believe it? Is there anything too hard for God? We go around and we go, nothing is impossible with God. We sing it. Do we believe it? Do we seek that priestly anointing that comes with faith? Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive according to Matthew 21, 22. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit rest upon all of us so that we can function in a priestly anointing. Psalm 141.2 says, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The incense was burned by the priest as part of the offering, symbolizing prayer rising to the heavens like smoke. You know, and sometimes our prayers don't have to be long. When I was young in the Lord, I never wanted to pray in front of him because my words were short. And he would be praying forever and ever and ever. And I said, oh, God probably doesn't hear my little short prayer. But I have a favorite movie that's shown in America. And I know you don't know it, but it's called It's a Wonderful Life. And the movie starts off with um, this man who wants to kill himself because he's in debt and owes this money. And an angel, God sends an angel from heaven to be with him. But the reason God sends the angel is that his wife, his children, people that he knew well, began to pray for him because they were worried about him. They didn't know where he was. And he was getting ready to commit suicide. They only had one word, help. Help, they actually had two words, help George. Help George, help, help George. It doesn't take a whole lot of words. It just take, takes prayer that is from your heart and from your spirit. Let's make it the morning sacrifice. Let's lift our hands. There's a verse in Isaiah 65, 24 that says, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are speaking, I will hear. While you're speaking about it, if you're walking in a way where the Holy Spirit is with you, in you, and resting upon you, you can grab hold of this anointing as a priest of the Lord wherever you are. And God hears you even before you even open it up. It could be in your heart or in your mind before you even open your mouth. God already knows and he's probably sending an answer already because that's the kind of God we serve. The prophetic anointing. The power to speak the word of God anointed to preach the good news, we have this gift to speak life to the world. With the prophetic anointing, God allows us to see with spiritual eyes. It's not the office, it's the gift. 1 Corinthians 12, seven through 10 says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. I, that's just amazing to me. It's given to each one of us, but not for us to gloat, oh, I can prophesy. I, you know, I have this amazing gift, but it's to help others, 
To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of, of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. The prophetic is not just dates and events. The prophetic is spiritual interpretation or insight into situations. It is having the mind of Christ and a voice that speaks, interprets, and understands that mind of Christ to people. Let me say that again. It's a voice that speaks, interprets, and understands the mind of Christ. Remember, we have the mind of Christ. So that voice speaks to people. In Luke 4.18, another group of verses here. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. Let's have eyes that give hope to people, that will give joy and peace to people. Ask the Lord for the prophetic insight that you can give to others, especially in situations where it looks like death and no hope. When you go to minister to people, ask the Lord for that gift. Ask him to give you that gift so you can speak life to people. That's what you want to do. You want to encourage people. But we have to activate it. So often, we just go in our own strength to, to minister to people. And we are not looking for God's anointing on us so that we can speak what thus saith the Lord says to people. We need to start activating that gift. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. We are to be eager to prophesy. C.H. Spurgeon says, ah, if there be degrees in glory, they will not be distributed according to our talents, but according to our faithfulness in using them. That's a powerful quote. It's not about your talents. You know, there are some talented people in the world. But if there's no anointing, I walk away from them. If there's no anointing, I don't want to be there. I want to be in a place where people are anointed to do what God has called them to do. And God has anointed some of you with the gift of prophecy. Spiritual gifts are divine enablements for ministry, characteristics of Jesus Christ that are to be manifested through the body corporate, just as they were manifested through the body incarnate. Another quote. Second Peter 1.19 says, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.21-22 now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. He's anointed us, he has sealed us, and he's given us the spirit. We need to receive it. We need to just receive it. In, Ecclesi in Ecclesiastes 9, 8, it says, let your garments always be white, and let your head lack no oil. Lack no oil, which represents the anointing coming upon your life. I chuckle because I've had that oil of anointing poured on me twice. I, we lived in Nigeria for two years, and as we were, get, were preparing to leave Nigeria, um, it was a well-known Nigerian pastor, Archbishop Benson Idahosa, that we worked on. My husband taught in the Bible school. I worked with um, a youth group there those two years but as we were leaving and as I'm, as I'm processing this right now telling this story I can see why my three sons there's an anointing on their life because all five of us dressed in our Nigerian white clothes were up on the altar 
And I had, who are they? Oral Roberts, not to mention Archbishop, and there was someone else. I can't think of the other, but I remember Oral Roberts pouring oil over my head and laying hands on us as a family. He just went down the line and praying over us. It, that was amazing. And then I got ordained with Elam Fellowship, and when you get ordination, they dump the oil on you too. So there I was twice being anointed. I would say I lack no oil, you know, because the Holy Spirit has used these situations in my life to um, demonstrate that his presence is with us. That the Lord desires to pour the oil of his presence upon you so that you may walk in the kingly, priestly, and prophetic anointing. So see yourself with these anointings. You are carrying the anointing of a king, priest, and the prophetic. I want to close in a different way. I would like, I'm going to ask Pastor Linda to come up, my husband to come up, and I think I would like um, the pastor, that was, is it Edwin, that was praying earlier? Yes. And I'm going to ask them, for those who want this anointing, to pray over you. I'd like for my husband to pray for the kingly, and you got, this is a teacher in me, 25 years. You pull people out, you make it interaction, you know. You know? Uh, I would like for um, my husband to pray for the kingly anointing, for those who would like it in your life. The authority to speak what thus saith the Lord, to believe for it, to believe it is done. And I would like um, Pastor Edwin to pray for the priestly anointing for those who would like the priestly anointing this afternoon, and for uh, Pastor Linda to pray for the prophetic anointing. Okay, amen. And maybe we can just play some soft music. Um, so let's begin with the kingly anointing. And let me repeat, the kingly anointing is the anointing where God's presence is upon you and you speak with authority. And maybe as you stand for this, there may be some people in your life already that you know that you need to speak a word over and you've been fearful and, and not willing to, to step out in faith. God is saying to you today, it's time. It's time for you to walk in that kingly anointing. So if you would come, anyone that would like to see that anointing, he will pray for you. Please stand. Father, we're thankful that in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, you called forth your Son. And now, Father, in the fullness of times, in the times that we're living in right now, you are calling forth sons and daughters. And just as you anointed Jesus when he stood in the river, you are anointing sons and daughters right now in the name of Jesus right now for you have called them they have not chosen you but you have chosen them and anointed them that they may bring forth fruit and that their fruit might remain in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Lord, we praise you for the word we just heard right now. We pray, Spirit of the living God, it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's by your Spirit. And right now we say, we receive that kingly anointing upon our lives now, in the fullness of time. We dare not go from this place in our might and power. We receive your anointing. In the name of Jesus. And just as a reminder, the priestly anointing is for consecration. It's prayer. It's time spending in prayer. It's time sacrificing. It's like turning away the meal for a while. It's calling for fasting. Amen.
Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Father, we stand here, but we kneel down, we bow down before you, O Lord, knowing, O Lord, the responsibility of receiving the anointing, the priestly anointing, O Lord God. Lord, to intercede, to pray, to petition you, O Lord God, to stand in the gap, O Lord God. Lord, as priests, as watchmen over our own family, Lord God, over our own church, over the nation, over the nations of the world, O Lord God. Lord, as you give us the burden, O Lord, for the nations, Lord, you are just so interested, Lord, to, to bless each one of us, each of our children, each of our grandchildren, each of our loved ones, each one of our leaders, O Lord, in the church, Lord. And we pray and we receive the mantle of the priestly anointing, O Lord God. We ask it, O Lord God. We desire it, O Lord God. Lord, give us the faith, O Lord. God, to resist the flesh, O Lord God, to fast and to pray, O Lord God, to take the time, O Lord God. Father, we pray and we receive that mantle, O Lord, even now, as we ask it, O Lord, by faith, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And the prophetic anointing to encourage people to have the mind of Christ and be able to hear His voice. We want that, Lord. Even as, even as the Apostle Paul said, earnestly desire the gifts, but mostly that you will prophesy, because prophesying edifies the church, edifies and builds up the people of God. And Lord, I thank you for your people here today. And I thank you, Lord, that you have given hearing ears, but you have also given gifts to your people. Lord, we pray that those who have the gift of prophecy, Lord, that they would stir that up just as Timothy did, stir up the word of the Lord, and without fear and without timidity, they would give the word of the Lord with power, with authority. We pray, Lord, that there would be a release of the prophetic in your people. Lord, that there would not be any more the swallowing of the word of God and not letting it come out, but there would be the opening up of the mouths wide and that your people declare your words. Lord, let the spirit of prophecy rest upon your people that one by one, they will deliver the word of the Lord with confidence, building up your people and also the gift of prophecy. Let it be released. Lord, there are so many, there are so many that have the gift of prophecy. They hear the word of the Lord, but they do not open their mouths. We pray that there would be a release, Lord, of your spirit. There would be a releasing of the prophetic anointing. There would be a releasing of the word of the Lord, that your church would not be a Pentecostal church without Pentecost and without the gifts, but that your church would be filled with the gifts of the Spirit, with prophecy, Lord, that when people and unbelievers come into the church, that their hearts, their hearts would be revealed, and in fear they would turn to you, that those who come with needs and with questions, Lord, that the gift of prophecy would prophesy to those needs, and your people would be built up and strengthened. Let there be that release, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Let your people who have that gift go out opening their mouths, not being afraid to speak, but afraid not to speak, Lord. Afraid not to speak. Afraid of what you will do, Lord, of grieving the Spirit. But with confidence, they will bring forth the word of the Lord. And we thank you and we praise you by the Spirit of God.